Welcome to New York, Quebec, and the water route to the center of the world. This is bonus episode nine, Faces and Spaces of Bondage, Chattel Slavery in New France, New Netherland, and Colonial New York. I am seeking to hash out the societal boundaries of the Atlantic world to better develop the contextual background and widen the regional focus of the podcast narrative. This is very important as we examine the state of slavery throughout the basin by connecting New York and Quebec to the system of exchange known as triangle trade. While the system of slavery took on unique contours depending on local circumstances, both colonies were greatly impacted by laws, customs, and practices developed in the Caribbean. My goal is to illustrate the state of chattel slavery as it existed on the eve of the French and Indian War in 1754, set at the northern periphery of this worldwide system of economic exchange. Slavery had existed on both sides of the Atlantic Basin long before Europeans established a global economic trade based upon tapping into these existing networks. African kingdoms maintained the practice of slavery, which was fueled through warfare and debt. Natives in the New World had also practiced slavery wrought by battle and used in sacrifice. The Mexican Central Valley and the Andes were significant locations of major slave-fueled empires before European arrival. The Aztecs were known to require thousands of tributes in order to sacrifice in honor of their gods. Inca armies obliterated shrines and villages of rebels, enslaving them to work on plantations or care for the mummified remains of ancestors. I've discussed previously on our episodes on the Iroquois, wartime capture was essential to both the growth and diversity of the northeastern woodland tribes. Warfare was never geared towards total annihilation or destruction of a defeated enemy, but heavily weighted towards capture for adoption or ritual sacrifice of the opponent. Archaeological discoveries near the modern-day city of St. Louis have unveiled elite graves accompanied by murdered servants. The mound societies of the Mississippi Valley most likely used slave labor to construct their massive monuments. Though fluid, the remnants of this population began to cluster around extended familial clans that kept balance throughout the five reestablished peoples of the high country around the Great Lakes. One of the distinguishing factors of unity found in the archaeological and oral records is of a peace protocol in which slavery takes a major role. The Calumet ceremony, named after the intricately constructed pipe, placed slavery as the central focal point. Pipes would take hours of labor from all different individuals of a particular village and bear marks that had a limited and overlapping regional visibility. Pipes were even used as passes to symbolize alliance or friendship of the bearer. The protocols of the ceremonial exchange called for the presenting chief to invite guests to partake in the tobacco smoke which bridged earth and sky. After each individual warrior from the host village would use the pipe to mimic the slaying of his enemies and then recount every individual slave he took in battle. Guests were meant to be intimidated by the fate they might share and see the host village as potential allies. To seal the deal, the guests would be offered slaves meant to cement their new friendship with the host village. Slave raids maintained a delicate balance by providing a source of population replacement, but the dangers were shared by all. Once a raid was sanctioned, reprisal attacks would be experienced. The small size of the population and relative isolation of New France forced the habitants into an already established system of native economic exchange. Native war captives were an essential part of this pre-existing system and one the newly arrived French were loath to interrupt. Accepting cultural practices and value systems allowed the French to not only maintain their tiny presence amongst a sea of natives, it enriched their connections to the familial and political networks needed for free transit in pursuit of the fur trade. If the captives were not directly executed in a ritualized manner, enslavement was meant to strip away the previous identity of the war captive. Conditions could improve over time, but most found themselves starting out as domestics who were widely abused or neglected. This was intended to demonstrate power at both the personal and tribal level, as captive taking was intertwined in diplomatic exchanges and cemented boundaries. By accepting a little flesh to stabilize their alliance with Western Indians, the colonists of New France acknowledged the symbolic power of captive exchanges to build a union and foster peace. Yet, rather than willingly embracing their allies' captive customs, French officials assented only when natives demanded their participation. Ironically, then, Indian slavery originated as a partial defeat of New France's power, historian Brett Rushforth. 
Native slavery existed in New France for more than a century starting in the mid-1600s and would continue through the capitulation of Quebec, which allowed for the carryover of French enslavement practices to British rule. Plains natives in bondage could be seen throughout New France's varied levels of society. They worked as domestics in the great households of Montreal and Quebec, while others were employed in the naval crop industry along the banks of the St. Lawrence. Still another significant group were engaged in the trade logistics sector on fur expeditions. On the frontier settlements of the Great Lakes, the sexual nature of slavery was most visible. Native slave women were offered to traders in the same manner of hospitality found in native villages. Many of these slave women bore children baptized by Jesuit priests and with fathers unknown. Only their owner's name would be marked down. Each side used native Great Plains slaves in this manner of sexual domination. Consensual relations and marriage did occur, as this could lift one's status and create familial connections. Native slaves were baptized if they could be qualified to be under proper tutelage or express knowledge of the Catholic faith. Iroquois pressure on the Ohio and Illinois country forced a series of shifting alliances between the Ohio Valley and Plains natives by the late 1600s. Though traditionally the Plains had been the hunting grounds for slaves, Iroquois threats made strange bedfellows. The Anishinaabe of the Pei Den Ho were still able to act as the middlemen in the slave trade east and regulate French efforts to expand outside their tiny interconnected satellite regions by the early 1700s. The French establishment of Detroit in 1701 inflamed tensions and unbalanced the region. The Plains natives, including the Fox, were invited to settle near Detroit. These were the very people recently being enslaved, and now they were being offered French protection. The St. Lawrence Valley continued to see a steady flow of mainly Fox slaves, and the Intendant Rodeau declared native slaves to be property in 1709. The natives of the Pei Den O finally convinced the French to abandon any efforts to bring the Fox peoples into their alliance. Combined French and Great Lakes warriors decimated the Fox nation. Cornering almost 1,000 Fox refugees in 1730, half were slaughtered and the rest enslaved to be sent east. The Sioux had refused the Fox people any shelter and for good reason. They too had been targets of Upper Great Lakes slave raiders that sought to block a burgeoning trade with enterprising coureurs de bois. Flexible trade licenses were even issued that granted legal trade in peacetime only. Traders had to cease operating on the plains if allied natives were in conflict with the Sioux. French traders imperiled the entire enterprise by buying slaves the allied nations had procured from Sioux territory. The Sioux would then attack the French traders and the cycle would intensify. Similar strategies to manipulate French interest against both the Fox and Sioux people were used by the peoples of the Pays Den Ho. Slavery served as a way to unite the powerful Europeans on the coast to a confederated band of native tribes exerting their agency through the position of interlocutors. The natives of the Upper Great Lakes had found a way to replenish their society against the Iroquois onslaught, seal a powerful alliance, and make great economic gain in the process. The larger story of the history of slavery in New France is a story of the captured native prisoners of war from the Great Plains. Though nine out of ten slaves in the streets of Montreal would have been of native origin, I wanted to discuss the lesser known presence of African slaves in the St. Lawrence River Valley. Several hundred African slaves were used in a mostly domestic manner in urban centers like Montreal. African slaves came to the St. Lawrence River Valley indirectly as part of French prizes of war taken from English ships or settlements in the Caribbean. Other slaves were brought over to the colony in small numbers as they accompanied their owners. No direct slave importation is recorded to have arrived in Quebec, but French authorities had to categorize the rising numbers of Africans by the middle of the 18th century. All Africans in New France were categorized as slaves to distinguish them from native POW captives that could still obtain their freedom. Individuality was removed, and African captives now were only considered to be property. African slavery constituted between 5 to 10 percent of the entire slave population of New France, with Montreal being the epicenter of African slavery in Quebec. It's here where we can glimpse some acts of agency. Historian Alan Greer recounts a story of Marie-Joseph Angelique, who set her mistress's Montreal house on fire in 1734. The blaze burned 46 buildings but didn't kill anyone. She attempted to flee with a white indentured servant lover 
but was quickly captured. Angelique was born in Madeira and was enslaved by the Portuguese about 20 years earlier. She was bought by a Dutch merchant and sold in a New England port to a French Montreal merchant. Her trail reveals the nuanced layers that encompassed African slavery in the St. Lawrence Valley. Testimony describes her constant outings and friendly interactions with neighbors and children. Her friendship with a native slave of the neighboring house is also highlighted. Life was tough as her bed was a pallet and she received physical beatings from her mistress. She was recorded as having three children who sadly didn't survive infancy, and it seems the father was a Malagasy-born slave through which Angelique's owners were forced to sexually assault her for possible offspring. She developed a feud with another white indentured servant and demanded the woman be fired. Astonishingly, her owner complied and had the offending servant dismissed. Angelique's relationship with a white male servant grew, and she demanded the same path to freedom as she witnessed other native slaves being given. Her mistress refused this request and Angelique resisted. She talked back to her owner, threatened her with death by roasting, quarreled with the other servants in the house, threatened them too with burning, and made life so unbearable for her fellow servant, Marie-Louise Poirier, that she quit her job. Her owner became irate and sold her to a Quebec merchant who then intended to forward her to the dreaded French Antilles. A sail to the Sugar Islands would mean certain death for Angelique, and she attempted revenge by setting the fire before she was sold on. Her trial refused to recognize that she acted alone and attempted to break her through torture to expose any accomplices. She never broke under horrendous pain and was given the mercy of a hanging before her body was publicly burned at the stake. Unlike many American colonies where Indian slavery was replaced by Africans in the early stage of settlement, native slavery made up the majority of those held in bondage in New France throughout the colony's final century. Driven by dual demands of alliance politics and economic profits, slavery in New France bridged the geographic and conceptual divide, separating the worlds to produce the Great Lakes halter and Caribbean shackles, forcing creative cultural adaptations that will transform both worlds historian Brett Rushforth. Let's examine how slavery connected the larger French-speaking world of the Atlantic Basin. The entry point of societal recognition in the French Atlantic world was the local parish priest. Any important documents that would allow access to or movement within this colonial sphere would require priestly signature. Official status and legal recognition was achieved upon the document being registered into the local church archives. The Seven Years' War brought rapid change to the Lesser Antilles or Windward Islands. Imperial sovereignty switched in the blink of an eye, and centralizing surveys were undertaken that saw widespread monocultural sugar production become the goal. Formerly semi-autonomous maroon and fully autonomous native zones were now given over to government parceled land. Thriving communities of mixed race peoples had existed outside the formerly fluid boundaries of imperial rule but now they were subject to both capricious and restrictive racial definition laws. The French Atlantic former Kalinago territory, like the island of St. Lucia, were subjected to a stricter racial social hierarchy developed on St. Domingue. A large and growing population of Jean de Couleur lived on the prosperous French western third of the island of Hispaniola. Close documentation requirements sought to close the field of liberty to free blacks, so this population was forced to endure the psychic brutality of having to argue for one's full humanity, according to Brett Rushford. On the eve of the American Revolution, 40,000 freed people of color lived in Haiti. As restrictive laws increased, this group sought to officially establish and document their status. By the 1780s, freed people of color made up the majority of marriages in many parishes, according to Robert Tabor. Racial categories became exclusively documented in the years after the 1750s, and no one could escape a label on their union. The French Caribbean's center of gravity was shifting by the middle of the 18th century, with Saint-Domingue rising to prominence. The vast majority of African slave imports now moved toward this colony and left the southern French Antilles, undersupplied with enslaved labor. A 1739 royal ban on Indian enslavement made the crisis even worse in islands like Martinique, whose plantations contained numerous natives captured in raids to the south in places like the Grenadines or the northern coasts of South America. The French king had sought to stop these raids against peoples the state was not in conflict with. New France's population of native slaves were captured in battle against nations hostile to French interests. 
How would the Crown view the transportation and sale of Canadian enslaved natives to the Caribbean? In 1742, a French sea captain arrived in St. Pierre on the island of Martinique. His cargo included a teenage native slave girl from the Great Plains. Native slaves were fetching four times the purchase price on islands like Martinique due to the diversion of slave ships to Saint-Domingue. The French sea captain found a ready buyer who was a wholesale merchant. The captain was promised payment upon resale of this native slave girl. The native teen was apparently told of the recent royal decree banning Indian slavery, and she ran away before she could be resold. The French captain sought to be reimbursed for the loss of his property. His case was at first rejected by local authorities on the island, as they applied the recent decree to mean the native girl was indeed free. The ruling was appealed, and the king intervened to state that the former decree did not apply to Canadian native slaves captured in battle against known enemies of France. The ruling opened up a little-known trade that operated in a legal gray area between New France and the French Antilles. Native captives became more prominent in cargo listings and attempts to set up a formal trade were started. This failed mainly due to the racial structures needed to organize African-based slavery in the French Caribbean versus the tactic diplomatic and familial networks that were needed to connect the society of New France. Authorities in Canada could not apply the strict racial categories and separations to native interactions, otherwise they would risk losing their entire enterprise. POW status became the defining markers of enslavement, and a small trade of natives continued to trickle south until the fall of Quebec. French colonial slavery was regulated through the infamous Code Noir, but this legal framework was not known by that term until almost 40 years after its proclamation. Introduced by Louis XIV in 1685, the collection of slave codes was originally referred to as the Edict of March 1685. It slowly morphed into the ordinances and finally the shorthand term of Black Codes by 1720 in the French Antilles. Historian Brett Rushforth writes, The law grew out of a series of power struggles between the enslaved and their would-be masters. These struggles first registered in local acts designed to solve immediate human problems, masters and slaves expressed opposing interpretations of slavery, and competing aspirations for life in the colonies. They reveal not only the ideals of French masters, but also the actions of enslaved Africans and Indians whose daily assertions of their own humanity challenged the fiction of their status as property. While the Code Noir was aimed primarily at regulating African slavery, New France contained very little enslaved Africans compared to native captives. Historian Brett Rushforth provides two contrasting court cases to help us tease out the applied legal framework governing slavery. Within the cases, we can see both the origin of slave codes developed in the French Antilles and the difficult local circumstances that prevented their clear application to Quebec. In 1719, an African slave named Antoine was employed by the governor of Montreal in his sawmill when a patrolling colonial soldier engaged in an argument with him. The soldier attacked the unarmed slave with his sword and killed him after many blows. The offending soldier was required to pay compensation by having his goods sold at auction to cover the cost of Antoine's purchase. The crime was treated as a property crime and not a murder of a person. Almost a decade later in 1728, a member of the Fox Nation was captured in war and working for his master at the docks of Montreal. This young man was approached by French sentinels, but had the proper papers to be out on errand for his master. Not satisfied with this, the French soldiers hurled abuses at the native. A scuffle ensued in which the young man named Jacob was shot and killed at very close range. The soldier was arrested and put on trial for the killing. At first, the case proceeded much like the previous case a decade earlier by focusing on compensation for lost property. Then the governor general and several prominent military officers petitioned the court to transfer jurisdiction to the military. They argued that regardless of the circumstances of the incident, the Fox slave was a POW and member of an enemy nation. The military hierarchy sought to control the trade in native POWs as it was a recognized economic and diplomatic system of exchange established with the allied native nations friendly to France. The court ignored the military establishment and convicted the soldier for destruction of property. The governor then pardoned the soldier by again asserting his control over military affairs. The royal intendant overrode the governor and proceeded with the punishment of the soldier trying to assert civil law.
and established slave code precedent. The governor took one final chance and appealed the decision to the French king. The soldier was pardoned on the technicality of self-defense, but the civil authorities were reminded that interaction between French soldiery and enemy nations was to be regulated by the military leadership. In early 1991, a building on the lower stretch of Broadway was being constructed when a stunning sight appeared in the ground about 30 feet down. Archaeologists were called in and they uncovered a site more than six acres in size, but the discovery was a somber one. This was a cemetery of more than 15,000 intact skeletons in use from the 1630s under the Dutch and finally being covered over in 1795 by the Americans. The human remains were those of African slaves who labored to build and maintain New Amsterdam or the later New York City. Now turned into a national park, the site near Wall Street is one I visited several times with my students. The Ancestral Chamber Monument is a walk-through transformation that makes teaching worthwhile. The presence of so many deceased churns introspection, but in life their impact has echoed down to the present. One might think these early African slaves were erased from memory or forgotten given the state the burial ground was found in, but I would be remiss to not urge one to peer just a bit further. Juan Rodriguez Way is a 50-street stretch of Broadway in Upper Manhattan named after Manhattan's first non-native settler. Four years after Henry Hudson surveyed the area, a half-Portuguese and half-African VIC employee named Juan Rodriguez demanded he be left ashore on the island of Manhattan. Rodriguez agreed to forfeit any pay or future claims against the company and was given some trade items to bring with him. He managed to meet up with the next Dutch trading vessel and procured furs to be sent to Europe. The return of VIC officials saw them attempt to enslave Rodriguez once again as he was now a competitor. He resisted and was gravely wounded, but was saved by native friends he had made on his time ashore. He eventually married into the local native bands and had a family who helped him pursue the fur business. He served as an interlocutor between later European traders and native peoples all towards securing pelts. Modern Dominican residents in Washington Heights latched onto his wonderful story of syncretism and his name graces the stretch of Broadway through the area. Historian David Hackett Fisher. According to historian Linda Rupert, in 1596, the first recorded Dutch slaving voyage landed 130 Angolan captives in Zealand. This human cargo was seized from a Portuguese vessel that was now fair game due to the Union of Crowns in Iberia. The Portuguese would become prime targets for the Dutch in the slave trade, and eventually even the plantations of Brazil itself would fall into their hands. Those in bondage owned by the WIC in New Amsterdam would also come directly from these same interdicted Portuguese slaving routes. The 130 enslaved Angolans were freed when it was discovered that all were Christians based on previous contact with the Portuguese. Slavery was officially prohibited in the Dutch Republic, but its lawmakers and theologians wrangled over the proverbial square peg in a round hole. The justification that stands out is the concept of a just war and whether those enslaved were simply being saved from death after defeat. Both church and state lent cover to the practice of chattel slavery in the colonies overseas. Enslaved persons were brought to New Netherland to facilitate the transition from a trading post to settler colony by the 1620s. Most of the colony's slaves were owned and employed by the Dutch West India Company, either placed to work on company property, fortifications, or rented out as day labor. Enslaved Africans filled an important labor role between the native peoples and the Dutch settlers. Most of the enslaved peoples were not brought directly from Africa, but were purchased already creolized from the Caribbean Basin or South America. Many of the slave shipments were actually taken from intercepted Spanish shipping. The center clearinghouse and the central focus of the Dutch slave trade would become the island of Curaçao, which gained in prominence after the Dutch captured the northern slave plantations of Brazil and would act as the administrative center of the Dutch Antilles holdings after its fall. Still, Stuyvesant's experience with the footprint and legal commodification of slavery from the Antilles and Brazil helped redevelop the labor outlook of New Netherland. Bondage brought with it the constant strains of heavy work. The African burial ground bones has provided us with this evidence according to historian David Hackett Fisher. Faces, wrists, arms, and ribs were broken, and evidence of outright murder were found complete with musket balls embedded in the deceased skeleton. To combat this horror, slaves quickly formed kinship groups around points of origin and offered their skills to the Dutch in ever greater cycles of privilege exchange.
After a 1641 fight that resulted in a murder, a group of eight slaves were rounded up for questioning. None of the group would actually finger the murderer, and all eight were condemned to hang, but this was an expensive proposition to kill off so many good laborers. A method of drawing straws was chosen so one could theoretically answer for the crime, but not impact the fortunes of too many owners. The largest and strongest of the bunch apparently drew the short straw, but broke the noose twice under his enormous weight. The Calvinist religious outlook could view this as divine intervention, but also it would seem community and financial pressure might have impacted the knot on the noose as well. Another story of communal agency exerted by slaves is the intervention in the rape of a young boy in bondage by another adult slave. The adult slave was executed, but the boy slave was considered impure and slated to be strangled and burned at the stake. While preparations were commenced for the unjust execution, the boy was flogged and released at the last moment. Slaves used the right of petition to gain payment for work on public projects and transformed this mechanism into a springboard for freedom. Military service was exchanged for land north of Wall Street, and this was negotiated to be inherited by the holder's children. A strong Afro-Dutch mixed culture took root in the Hudson Valley and across the river in northern New Jersey. Intermarriage and manumission is documented. The few privately owned slaves could expect to work off their manumission or receive it later in life. WIC company slaves were usually given half freedom, which required a substantial payment or physical work to be provided to the company on a yearly lifelong basis. Most controversial was the requirement that the future offspring of the formerly enslaved would be owned by the company. Baptism in the Dutch Reformed Church also further complicated this practice, but there seems to be lost separate records on the baptism of slaves. The famous Director General Peter Stuyvesant provides us with a precious insight into the lost records of religious syncretism. The director general had sent a shipment of both enslaved adults and children to the Dutch trading entrepot of Curaçao in 1650. Desperate letters soon flowed south, as it turned out that Stuyvesant's wife had the children baptized in the Dutch Reformed Church. The company frantically searched for the children, but they had been lost to new Spanish owners. Slaves could bring court cases and provide testimony, but the days of even half-freedom in New Netherlands was coming to an end in the last ten years before the English takeover in 1664. The landed patroons of the Hudson Valley and New York City would see large increases in slave shipments by the later half of the 17th century as the English completed the full transition to a settler colony that the Dutch had started. After early disagreements amongst the governing board of the WIC concerning the value of patroonships, the first major land grant was doled out to the Dutch diamond merchant Van Rensselaer in 1630. Patroons were required to supply their hereditary estates with colonists over the age of 15 to become tenants. In exchange for populating the colony, they retained judicial jurisdiction, the right to found churches, vital record-keeping duties, and received feudal dues. All of this was laid out in the 1629 Charter of Privileges and Exemptions, which was ratified by the Dutch States General. The charter allowed for a 10-year tax holiday for any tenants willing to settle, but refused the right of movement during that time period to encourage growth. Trade was sanctioned with New France and New England, but a 5% export tax must be paid first. Tenants could not sell anything produced without first offering it to the patroon as the Lord was required to front the cost of basic infrastructure. The charter also required that any land claimed by natives must be bought and not seized from them. In addition, patroons gained the right to use slave labor imported by the WIC on their landed estates. The company was also made responsible for the defense of the patroonship and their inhabitants. Estates were claimed from the Delaware to the Connecticut River and even down in the Southern Caribbean to Brazil. Patroonships were transferred and reaffirmed through a new allegiance to the English crown after 1664. Legally speaking, the English changed the name of the system from a patroonship to a ducal or manor system. British slave owners from the West Indies introduced severe racialized codification to staunch the creolized freedom of the Afro-Dutch. They had to respect by treaty any previous Dutch land grants to Africans, but they would no longer allow the freewheeling mixed society to grow. Manumission pleas were still allowed, but now the British charged exorbitant prices. Historian Nicole Masquiel describes a very interesting situation at the start of English rule that saw cooperation between major former Dutch power players and the ruling elite to maintain the system of slavery. 
former Governor General Peter Stuyvesant had to appear before the new English governor Richard Nichols in October 1664. He needed Nichols' permission to issue a warrant for four runaway slaves that escaped during the previous few months of turmoil. Cooperation here was absolutely key between the burgeoning Dutch merchant class and the new English elite of the Hudson Valley. Both needed the other if they were going to transform New York into a plantation economy based on slavery. Large slave dynasties like the Phillips owned stakes in shipping and cash cropping with their manor stretching from Riverdale through Ossining along the Hudson River. One can still visit the manor and view both the loading dock and grist wheel on a canal carved out to the Hudson. This mill pond marks the famous Headless Horseman Bridge, but don't let your visit be overshadowed by the unassuming rear entrance to the main house. This, of course, is the slave quarters where the manor's skilled workers would run the proto-industrial complex for their master. Let's look a little bit closer at some new slaving routes pioneered by the strange Anglo-Dutch partnership of the new Hudson Valley elites. The island of St. Marie, located off the northeast coast of Madagascar, was perfectly placed along the spice routes of the British East India Company and its syncretic ruling class of Malagasy nobles and European buccaneers had developed long tendrils reaching as far as the Hudson Valley. As I've discussed in previous threads and on my podcast, the Dutch merchant class was uniquely positioned to leverage their international contacts within the Navigation Act system. Poorly defined slave importation contracts for stock-sharing government-backed companies also placed Madagascar in a gray area. Early English governors of New York used privateers to take enemy prizes and, of course, do some trading while they happened to be sailing, but it was the New York Dutch merchants that provided the goods and funds for these privateers. The profits were great. A slave could be purchased for a few shillings in St. Marie as opposed to a few pounds in West Africa. There was plenty to split between the privateers, the New York politicians, and the patroons. Greed tends to break up many a good criminal enterprise, and this one was no different. Though the governors of New York issued the letters of Mark and invested in the venture, men like Frederick Phillips decided to cut out the middleman. Privateers would pull into New York Harbor by night, but unload a significant amount of cargo onto schooners. This was sent up to the Patroon's Manor via the Hudson and Small Creeks. Eventually, this scheme would be uncovered and the Patroon would find himself thrown off the Executive Council in 1698 for illegally conducting the slave trade in New York. Possibly more than 700 Malagasy slaves were smuggled into the plantations of the Hudson Valley, but the pirate haven declined by the first half of the 18th century after suffering from British government interdiction and finally Mughal attacks. The Van Rensselaer Patroon ship was the last major holdover from the Dutch era and their land grant was renewed by the English overlords. The Van Rensselaer Manor refers to the arrangement with English authorities post-1664. The expansion of the English manor system included the founding of several great holdings throughout the Hudson Valley. The Livingston Manor was created in 1686 and at 160,000 acres, stretched from the Hudson to Massachusetts in modern-day Columbia County, New York. Van Cortland Manor was granted in 1697 and spanned 86,000 acres across all of modern-day northern Westchester County. The Livingston and Van Cortland family would quickly become business partners and intermarry in the tight-knit community of Albany. Scottish by birth, Livingston had married into the Schuyler Van Rensselaer family, and his business partners, the Van Cortlands, had married into the Bayard Stuyvesant family. All had their business ties intermingled through old Dutch holdings and New English ones throughout the Atlantic Basin. The Hardenburg Manor was granted in 1708 and at 1.5 million acres was the largest land transaction of the New York colonial period. This mighty manor comprised much of the modern Catskill region of New York State. Only the Van Rensselaer's Manor lasted through the American Revolution and the early Republic. Slave imports changed patterns of ethnicity and re-Africanized the overall population held in bondage. Still, many clung to a creolized Afro-Dutch culture by the extensive use of the Dutch language and celebration of Christian holidays. These took the forms of carnivals and role reversal activities. Pinkster or the Pentecostal celebration was widespread among the enslaved of the Hudson Valley. By the 1700s, New York's slave population had doubled to 700 individuals. A total of 15,300 slaves arrived in New York between the end of Dutch rule and the start of the American Revolution. 
Acts of resistance to ever-tightening racial restrictions occurred in New York during the first half of the 18th century. Major slave revolts would arise in both 1712 and 1741, as the enslaved resisted the ever-tightening status of bondage. The 1712 revolt saw initial success as 23 slaves set buildings ablaze and killed the fleeing residents. Centering their actions around Maiden Lane, this group hoped to encourage a general uprising throughout New York City. The general revolt didn't materialize and the slaves fled to a swamp near Canal Street. Militia and soldiers from the fort started to close in. Several rebel leaders committed suicide and captured slaves faced brutal public executions. The failed revolt led to tightening restrictions of slave activities, which included bans on larges independent gatherings. The 1741 revolt or conspiracy is a bit more complicated. By 1741, the population of NYC has grown to over 10,000 inhabitants. This included 2,000 slaves. On the night on March 8th, a fire broke out in the governor's house at Fort George. The resulting blaze burned the governor's house to the ground, and an inquiry was launched by the province of New York. Justice Horsmanden focused his investigation on a young indentured servant by the name of Mary Burton. This young girl was indentured to a bar owner by the name of John Hewson, who had an establishment near Trinity Church. This was a place where slaves, sailors, and Catholics all mingled and created great angst among proper British society. Mary testified to an apparent robbery plot involving three slaves and a sailor who frequented the bar. She even fingered her indentured master as helping launder the stolen goods. Though she admitted to being witness to some serious criminal activity, she hadn't mentioned anything resembling a citywide slave revolt. It was at this point she was offered the opportunity to end her indentured service contract by the justice and started to produce an outline of a large-scale conspiracy. The slaves formerly implicated in the robbery were now accused of leading a plot to burn the city. Burton also named her indentured master and his family as central figures in what was turning into a multiracial class rebellion. It seemed enslaved Africans and Catholic immigrants were joining forces to overthrow the British-led order, and in what seemed to confirm the authorities' suspicions, the very next day, another rash of arsonist attacks struck the city. Soon a paranoid round of denunciations began, and more than 200 people were brought before the court. Tried by a panel including the prominent manor lords, the entire Hewson family was executed along with 27 others, while more than 70 suspected African slaves were sent to the Caribbean for harsh treatment. Historians debate whether a nascent plot was indeed hatched and exacerbated by the questionable judicial approach or whether a questionable judicial approach hatched the plot. The arsonist attacks were real and seemed to be organized enough, but did there exist a structured multi-ethnic underclass solidarity that sought to take on the established powers? Given the international scene of heightened imperial rivalries and real fears of Catholic powers launching attacks on New York, no wonder the city was a bubbling cauldron of societal discontent. By the start of the French and Indian War in 1754, slavery had become a significant part of the glue holding together the Anglo-Dutch landed gentry. Thanks so much for listening to New York, Quebec, and the water route to the center of the world. Music